So, uh, well, it's lovely to be here. Um, I am being massively upstaged by fish. Um, and uh, I have a, uh, a love of serverless um, that has been born of many years of messing around with Lambda and with uh, a whole range of various serverless technologies, uh, as will become clear. And I have a, a huge uh, excitement about the future of technology and how serverless is going to become the big thing. Of course, I'm going to stand here and tell you this. This is exactly what my talk says. Uh, I'm, and I'm just trying to you know, enthuse you about these technologies. But hopefully, after half an hour, you'll, you'll actually think roughly the same as I do. So why do I think that serverless is the future? Why do I think that serverless is cloud 2.0? Well, let's have a look. A little bit about me. Uh, I always think that this slide is a little bit pointless because you can just look me up on you know, Twitter, uh, which is basically where most people look, look, look people up and find, find out about people. A uh, little bit about me. Other than that, I'm an environmentalist. I care a huge amount about the planet. Uh, I've done a white paper that looks at uh, data center use and how much that impacts the planet. I would please ask you to have a look at that. I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but I'm also the co-founder of the Serverless Days movement. When it started, it was called Jeff Kompf. Um, who's heard of Jeff Kompf? Good, a few of you. There's a blog post that I wrote called Serverless is just a name. We could have called it Jeff. Um, serverless is a very bad name. It's, it's a really bad name, actually, for the entire movement. But we're stuck with it, so we've kind of got to do something about that at, at a later date. But we're probably never going to do it. I mean, cloud is a terrible name as well. It's nothing to do with white, fluffy things in the sky. Um, so we're kind of stuck with these words, and so we've got to use them. So yeah, that's all. So uh, let's see where we go from here. So there are a lot of people that think that when we talk about tech, we think about code, and that code is the most important thing. Code is everything. Code is the only thing that matters when we talk about tech. Well, I'm here to tell you that I don't agree. I think there are far more important things than code now. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, computers became kind of ubiquitous uh, in the early 80s. They, they became the, the thing that we needed when we had uh, a business. You needed to get a computer. It needed to be the right sort of computer, and it needed to have the right kind of software. And, uh, and it meant that there were certain software companies that became rock star software companies and rock star people. And uh, we, we kind of learned people's names, like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And they had, um, you know, they had huge profiles and became really important people within the world of business and, and in the world. And then we had this massive open source rebellion. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember when uh, everyone thought that Microsoft was evil. And I mean really evil. Everyone in the open source community was like, we are never using Microsoft ever again. I am buying a machine, and I am removing it, and I'm going to partition all the drives so that I can put Linux on it. And then we had to compile everything, including kernels, all of the time. Uh, and I mean all of the time, like every week. Um, and then nothing really worked. But we all were like, but it's not Microsoft. Um, and that's how it worked. And that, but we thought you know, software should be free. And that was the point, that software should be free. And that led to a movement. It led to this amazing movement that created things like the LAMP stack. So we had Linux, we had Apache, we had PHP, we had these technologies that created the ability for software to be available to everybody. It was available to anyone that needed to be able to create a piece of technology and put it on the internet. You had to get your servers into a data center. That was, that was more difficult. But then we kind of started to be able to have co-location and then virtualization and all of those other things. And then we had this step of commoditization. And if you've had a look at any of these Wardley maps around this world, you'll know that this was exactly what was bound to happen. And this commoditization led to essentially the taking over of the open source world and putting it into the cloud. And that cloud then became the thing that we all used. So it stopped being about the open source necessarily in terms of the server side of things, and then started to be about virtualization. And that's where we got to, which was we had the cloud, which was the virtualization technologies becoming commoditized. And that led to developers, developers of 
Software that sat on top of that virtualization being the key. And that's where we've got to about 2014, 15. And that was really important. And it led to books by people like uh, Stephen O'Grady at Red Monk, who just said, uh, developers, you know, they're the new kingmakers. The people that make the code that sit on top of this, they're the ones who make, who make the business value. They're the ones who make the changes. Because developers write code. That's what they do. Well, unfortunately, serverless actually blurs that line. It changes the way that you think about everything. It changes the way that you think about how you set up your teams. It changes the way you think about what you do as a developer. It changes the way that you understand what your role is within the organization. It's not just about technology. It's the next part of the revolution. It shifts the role of the developer from just being about writing code that sits on top of something else. Or at least I think it does. But what does it shift it to? Well, let's unpack it a little bit. So I put the revolution starting point in 2014 when AWS launched uh, AWS Lambda. Now, AWS Lambda essentially commoditized on-demand compute. That was what it did. It turned around and went, you can create on-demand compute uh, whenever you want. And it was a service that they created that did this. That was, what made, that was what made the difference. And that service was incredibly powerful, not because you couldn't have done on-demand compute before. There were other services that allowed you to do something similar beforehand. There were other services that allowed you to spin up a certain amount of compute on demand a bit slower, but you had to do a certain amount of work yourself. You might have had to have done uh, some coding yourself, but the simplicity and ease with which you could do it with Lambda was the key. And the simplicity and ease with which you could trigger that from other AWS services was the killer part of the application. And those triggers are actually what make it so powerful. And those integrations are why it's gone from where it was then to where it is now. And there are nearly 50 triggers that you can make from within uh, AWS's ecosystem to trigger a Lambda function now. Which is why when someone says, oh, serverless, it's just function as a service, which is what fast means, it's completely wrong. Function as a service is just function as a service. It's a huge enabler of the technology, but it's not serverless. It's entirely possible to build a serverless application without any function as a service completely. I've seen it. So let's go on to a little bit of a definition of what serverless is. And this is a definition I wrote in 2017. And it's a definition that has kind of stood the test of time um, with a lot of people. And when I talk to them about this, they kind of understand it uh, a lot better. So a serverless application is one that costs you nothing to run if nobody is using it, excluding your data storage costs. So if it's costing you nothing to run, when it goes down to no users at all, it should cost you nothing except for your storage of your data. So you shouldn't be running any databases. You shouldn't be running any, uh, you shouldn't be running any servers of any description. You shouldn't be running anything. It should literally cost you the cost of storage of data. But when it, when it scales up, it should scale up essentially proportionally to the amount of users you've got. That's how you should think about how serverless works. And that's a, an economic definition, not a technological one. And it's about understanding that developers need to consider business value. Um, and it's about uh, understanding the responsibilities of things like scaling and demand and how that will impact on other services around you. So it'll impact on how that scale will affect uh, uh, an underlying system or service that you're using. So if you scale up very quickly, what happens to the underlying service? And even though cost is mentioned, it's not actually about cost saving. This is where a lot of people get it very wrong. It's not about cost saving here. It's not about going, this is gonna save you an awful lot of money. It's actually a, a, just a shift in mindset. We'll come to that a little bit later. Actually what it's about Serverless is about infrastructure, and it's about shifting your mindset from, from, from code to infrastructure, 
and to infrastructure being king. And this is much more relevant because you've got to think about your vendor services. You've got to think about what's more relevant for your use case. And it means that you've got to be really good at tools like Terraform, or as I use it within the AWS ecosystem, SAM. And again, this is where we get to the serverless word being terrible. Serverless is, is, a, is unhelpful at this point. It would be much better to use something like serviceful. So what makes something serverless? How would you recognize it? So I have a friend, Joe Emerson. He goes on and on about how uh, serverless is about lines of code. Fewer lines of code is how you recognize something as being serverless. And I completely understand this idea. I think it is. And I think there's a, there's a lot in that because today's code is tomorrow's technical debt. And while most people won't necessarily agree with that, I think this is so true. I've seen it over and over again with building applications, developing applications, being the CTO of startups. The more code you have, the longer your, your uh, application exists, the more problems you end up with. The fewer lines of code you have, the better it is, because you just don't have so many problems. And I think that's why this is one of the most useful things you can probably take away from this talk. Um, it may not be the most useful, but I think it is. And that's why code is actually a liability. It's always a long-term liability. Just getting something to work is no longer good enough for a developer. If you're a developer, if you get something to work and, and you hand it over, it's like, well done, no longer my, my problem. It's not good enough anymore for me. And in fact, I would suggest that the ultimate serverless application actually has zero lines of code in it. I don't think I've actually seen a serverless application that has zero lines of code in it. Um, I'm not sure how you would do that, but I think maybe that's what we should be aiming for. Maybe that's what it is. And that's why where, that's where you've got to have, uh, think about, you've got to think about your configuration. You've got to think about understanding how you work out what your application looks like when you're not trying to write code all the time. Because configuration isn't code. Much as people might talk about configuration as code as a, as a thing, configuration is essentially a template telling you how resources fit together. It's not code, even though there are tools that can make it code. But in my head, it's not code. I have a little bit of experience of building applications. I built a um, serverless startup in 2015. Uh, we built uh, an application that went to 20 countries. It had half a million monthly active users. There were two developers on it, and we had a $300 a month AWS bill. That's $300 a month. Two people, 20 countries, half a million monthly active users. I know people that have databases that are $2,000 a month. I know people that have bills on their EC2 that are you know, in the five to six figures without even blinking. And they're not even close to doing what we're talking about there. I didn't figure it all out on my own. I was talking to the community. I was working these things out. But it was those kinds of things that made me realize that this was incredibly powerful, handing over the responsibility to uh, the vendor to AWS in this case. And I now teach people how to do this stuff. I go around and I consult and I help companies to do this stuff. And how do I do it? What do I tell them? Because actually, you can't teach it. You can't teach code in the same way. You can't teach them and walk in and go, you just do this. It doesn't work the same way. You basically have to go, your functions, your business logic, you use triggers where you would use code, and the hardest part, well, OK, so designing the overall application is relatively straightforward. You know that you've got a queue here, and you've got a function here. You might have a fan out pattern or something like that. Coding the actual functions, which everyone thinks is the difficult bit, is actually probably the easiest bit of the lot. And interacting with AWS or third party services from within those functions is even easier, because most of the time, you just pick it up from somewhere else, and there are code uh, solutions all over the place, especially if you're using a third-party service, because they'll probably give you the code to do it. It's all trivial. The hardest part is the configuration. Managing the configuration. Always. And more time is spent on that part than anything else. 
But once you've, once you've created that configuration, once you've got it, you can create really, really easily your, your dev, your staging environments, really straightforward to do it. And you can just spin them up really quickly. And you've already got your scaling, your availability, your monitoring, your uptime. It's already built in with all of these services when you've got them. And the problem is that a lot of the developers I've come across don't see that as business value. They see that as wasted time. And I nick this from my friend Ben Kehoe, uh, which is that days of coding can save you hours of configuration. Um, I've, I've seen this so many times when I've had a conversation where we've sat there trying to figure out a cloud formation template for um, you know, two hours, trying to work out how to do a permission or how to do this or how to do that. And someone just turns around and says, I could have done this so much more easily with Rails. And I'm standing there and just kind of head in hand going, what are you talking about? Um, and that's the point, is that once you've done it, it's incredibly scalable and, and transferable. Rails and Django and all of these other things, you have to manage, you have to look after. You've got all of these other problems that are things that most developers don't think about in terms of the long-term problems. And just... I love people who work in the container world. I love you all, you are brilliant. Please, 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 it's not serverless. Please, it's not serverless, thank you. So, the serverless shift. We are shifting, we are moving. We are moving from code to configuration. We're moving from code to as few lines of code as possible moving from building services to consuming services. And we're moving from owning workloads to disowning workloads. I do not want, as a CTO, to own anything that does not have business value. I don't want to run anything that doesn't have business value. Why would I? It's completely pointless. I want to make other people do the things I don't need, and I want my business value to be just the little bits that I have complete control over. So, who are going to be the new serverless kingmakers? Maybe it'll be those who grasp the infrastructure as king paradigm. Or those who grasp that perfect code is no longer that important, because it really, really isn't, and it probably never should have been. Or those who grasp that today's code is tomorrow's technical debt because it always was. Or those who grasp the idea that business value is more, more important than their own technical achievement. So I realized something, just in the last couple of days, actually. Why do serverless? It's a, it might sound a bit strange, but I realized that my definition was lacking something. So my definition, again, a serverless application is one that costs you nothing to run if nobody's using it, excluding data storage costs. It's slightly missing a bit of the why. It's not about app scaling. It's not about simply reducing lines of code or technical debt or servers or anything like that, although they're incredibly useful and positive side effects. The why is actually really simple. It's about faster to build new features. It's about being quicker to onboard new people, and it's about being faster to recover from failures, because that's what I've seen when I've seen people that have built serverless applications. And I absolutely know that I just said it sometimes takes longer to build. When you do the configuration, it can take longer to build than someone who's building a Rails application or something like that. Yes, it can take longer to initially build the solution. The point is that I don't look at things from the point of view of a software solution and then a delivery. I look at things from the point of view of a whole application lifecycle, from the start, from the initial development, to then managing it, to then thinking about replacing it at the end of its life. That can be three to five years. And the number of times that I've seen developers go, here, it's completed, hand it over, and then not consider the consequences of the decisions that they've made is pretty much every single software development project I've ever seen. And every single CTO is sitting there going, well, yes, that's, that's pretty much true. 
because CTOs are sitting there trying to think about the three to five year lifetime of their application. They're trying to look at it and go, how do I make this work over the long term? And the application lifecycle is really, really important. A serverless approach is by far the most effective solution I've found for delivering a rapid pace of development over the whole life cycle of an application. Keeping that pace up, getting quicker, going faster. And that has a really interesting consequence. Because essentially, it doesn't really matter about the cost. You're not really that bothered about the cost at that point. Because if you're going quicker, if you're getting faster, if you're just caring about the cost at that point, you've got it wrong. Serverless costs are actually a real rounding error. I really didn't care about my AWS bill. Whenever I tell someone that it costs $300 a month to run this application, everyone's like, wow, that's amazing. I couldn't care less. I really didn't look. What I was interested in was, was my CEO giving me more work, and could we deliver it more quickly? And the answer was yes. And we could deliver more quickly. In fact, we ran out of work. We were delivering more and more and more and more with two people than most development teams with 10 could do, because we'd picked a really simple and straightforward way of developing. And that's the point. We were focusing on the business value of what we were doing. And that should be the focus. And when you've got that kind of focus, you end up with conversations with people like VCs who are turning around and saying things like, are you running serverless to their startups? That's a really interesting question. Because why do they care? Are they interested in giving you a whole bunch of money so that you can then spend it on building a tech team of 200? No. What they're interested in is, are they going to get their money back? And what's the best way of doing that? Actually, they're beginning to learn that the best way of doing that is looking at the approach and the tech team and how that they're doing that. And that is probably going to be serverless over the next five to 10 years. This is the kind of thing that people are looking at now. So I've just created a new definition of serverless. And it's just making it more explicit. A serverless application is one that provides maximum business value over its application lifecycle, and that costs you nothing to run if nobody is using it, excluding data storage. And I literally came up with that one today. So this is new, world exclusive. So enjoy it. You can all tell me I'm wrong later, but that's absolutely fine. But I think that puts even more emphasis on understanding that it's not about the technology. It's about understanding your place in the business and understanding your, un your place in recognizing the value of what you're doing, not trying to be clever technically. And so a little bit of a problem that we have is we lack the tools. So there are lots of companies out there building for Cloud 1.0. You know, we've got all of the tools to make sure that our servers are up and uh, page us when we need them, uh, and uh, tell, us, uh, you know, tell us when our containers need to be upgraded, and security tools all around that, and we've got a whole load of CI, CD things, but actually we're really short of the tools to do, to do a lot of the things in this area. And that's because there aren't that many uh, serverless companies out there doing this. There will be, it will happen, we're just not there yet. But serverless is the future. It is the direction of travel. Some of us are showing the way. We're recognizing it's way more than just function as a service. It's so much more about understanding the business value. So go forth, be serverless, because serverless is cloud 2.0. Thank you very much. <laughs>